Hi class, um, let's start chapter one, microeconomics. Okay, so the book is called The Principle of Microeconomics by Sayer and Morris, uh, the ninth edition. That's the book we're gonna utilize for this uh, course. Uh, it's published on McGraw Hills if you wanna go and have as a soft copy of it. And uh, basically, uh, let's start with the chapter one. In this chapter, what we're gonna learn is describe why economics is a very relevant, why do we need economics and why is it very relevant, define uh, economics and make a decision between macroeconomics and microeconomics, demonstrate the scarcities, uh, which is the limit to resources, the choice and the opportunity cost uh, are at the heart of economics, and making efficiencies cornerstone uh, of the discipline. We also gonna learn about uh, explaining why trade results in economics being more productive. Why do we need a trade? Uh, explain the three fundamental questions and explain the four ways of economics can be categorized. Uh, and we will use the production possibility model to illustrate choice, opportunity costs, efficiencies, and unemployment. So now the relevance of economics, the controversies that we always involve in it, knowing that economic growth is just, the countries are growing, uh, there is economic growth in it or not, um, income redistributions, uh, road uh, pricing, and uh, globalization. What is economics? Well, there is two, two parts of uh, how we put the statement, is the positive statement, facts that can be verified with the empirical data. It means that, um, nine o'clock in the morning, so there is a sun shine or a daytime. Uh, that's very positive, they call it positive statement. Uh, when it's the data is very clear associated with the, the result. Normative statement is based on a person belief or a value system and cannot be verified with the data. <clears throat> so if we say um, the person became rich the question comes in here, how rich he got compared to what? Um, when you say um, the student uh, was passed the course as a, a number 10, the highest 10 people. Now, if he's on a 10, a number 10, what's the number nine got? Did he get 61% uh, or did he get 99%. So there is, it depend on, cannot verify it with the data. So that's what we mean by normative statement is, has a point of view. You get a data and you drive your point of view from it. Now, as example, to make it more clear is when we say the federal government budget this year is a largest in history, this is a positive because a budget, a number, a dollars that you can count on them, um, count them. Now, when you say the national debt is at the manageable level and therefore is nothing to worry about it, here where you is based on your point of view. So the national debt could be rising, but you're not worried about it because it's under control or because it's declining and you're not worried about it and it's under control. So it's a normative, it depends on the value that you see and believe. When you say the, the price of gasoline is a higher than it need to be, is a normative uh, for a poor person, probably this high, it's very high for very rich, 
is a normative. And the rising Canadian exports are creating many new jobs in the countries. That's probably a, a positive uh, because it's numbers supported by data. But what is economics? Economics uh, made of economics theories and driven with that. Now, look at how positive statements are related. Now, use the scientific method. When you do an economic theory, you use a scientific method. Any theory that you're building, you need a scientific method for it. Now, to do a scientific method, and probably you, some of you took it in the marketing research, is first you set up the hypothesis. Say, X will result in Y. Now, this is a hypothesis. Then you define the term and the state of assumption. Is you say X will result if Y, if other things is not changing. Or, uh, yeah, if other things is a stable, something like that, just to keep it simple. Then you really gather the data. So when you gather the data, and suddenly you find when it's so X is resulted, does not result in Y, for example, but two X will result in Y. So here is you gather the data to the hypothesis, which is then you adjust your hypothesis back and you say two X will result in Y. And then you take this process again, define the term, and you say, assuming everything, no Z there, no F there, no Y, no B there. And this is where you do the assumption. So 2X will result in Y. And then you gather the data as again, and then it's approved, and then you accept it. Otherwise, if it's showing, keep changing again and again, then one day it becomes five, four X's, cause Y, and one day become one X cause Y, then you reject this, uh, the, the, the hypothesis. But once for a stable and valid, always two X becomes a Y, then it becomes a proved or a positive hypothesis, which is, it turns to be a, a theory. And the economic theories is also driven from this scientific approach. Now, we have two type of economics. One is macro and, uh, and micro. Uh, in a macro, how the major component of an economy interact, like uh, unemployment, inflation, interest rate. I assume you have taken the micro, uh, the macro class uh, with me or somebody else. And it's basically, is it's all in whole picture in a way. In a micro, which is our focus in this course, is the outcomes of a decision by people and firms. Keep in mind, you might, uh, every firm, how it operates is different than how the whole economy is operating. One person might be operating different than the whole, the whole society out there. So it's also the microeconomics is based on supply and demand, based on the cost of the production and market structures. Let me give you a good example is if you are looking at, for example, at a price. In a macro level, you go the average of all uh, products, which is uh, price parities or PPP. In a micro level, you average, uh, I mean, you say of a particular product, like the, the gas, the oil, uh, the price of banana, something like that. Um, in a production, we look at uh, the whole economy, the production of the whole economy. In the micro, we look at a particular firm or industry. We're not looking at the whole thing, the industry like a, a telecommunication industries or Apple uh, or uh, Microsoft, a particular uh, uh, entity. Then we talk about income in macro, we talk about total national income like the GDP and GMP. Here we're talking about certain profession 
or factor of incomes. In the employment, we talk about, in macro, we talk overall uh, national employment. Here, we once again, we look at by firm, industry, or occupation, doctors, or lawyers, or teachers. Taxes, once again, we look at the whole government tax system and the, the, the total taxes here for the individual or a firm. So there, there is a whole picture, which is a micro, uh, macro level. And then the, this big picture is made up by smaller pictures gathered together. And this is where we do the micro level, the smaller pictures, basically. Now, let's test what our understanding. Identify which of the following topic will likely be in a microeconomics course and which in the macro course. The price of iPods, for example, will be in the micro because we are talking about a product here. The unemployment rate, once again, it will be a macro because we're talking about the whole country, for example. The presence of monopolies is a micro because it's a certain part. It's not the whole country in a monopolies, it's some sectors or industries. The rate of a growth, uh, economic growth, once again, is a macro. It's pretty clear. So these are the differences you need to evaluate them and see which one is macro and which one at the micro level. Now, when we do any economy, we have an economy approach, we do one important crucial issue is resources are scarce. Resources are limited. Resources are not available as much as we want. You have a $10, you cannot buy something worth of $50 because your resources, your money is limited. Resources or a factor of production or inputs are anything used to produce a good and services. So if you wanna produce something, you need the resources. And these resources could be limited so you cannot produce as much as you want as according to your resources. Now, do not have enough resources to produce everything everybody wants. So there is a limited. So if you wanna focus on building schools, your resources gone on focusing on building schools, you cannot have a, for example, very strong defense system. Uh, must have some way to retain scarce of resources that you need to keep these scarce of resources once depleted, you probably will not get it again. Now, the resources itself is four part. Do not mis make a mistake between capital and money or enterprise and companies. Enterprise, in other words, is the entrepreneurs. Um, so the four type of resources, first is the labor, which is a human, mental, and physical effort. Secondly is the land. Any natural resources used to produce a good or service. So oil is part of the land. Um, uh, um, housing is a part of the land. Then capital is, it could be tool, equipment, factories, and building used in the production process. So they are in a production process. Here, the land is any nat natural resources used to produce a good or service. Capitals are tools who help you to produce this. And the enterprise is the human resources that innovates and takes the risk and come, as we say, the business people, the entrepreneurs is the best word for it. Now, when these uh, resources, how do they get paid? And once you, you know the pay resources and how they get paid, it's easy to distinguish between them. Anything that gets wages, salaries is called a labor. Anything that gets paid through a rent, 
is called land, like a house is considered to be land in economics. Um, so because they, you pay the rent for the landlord, um, and that's called a landlord. Anything that collect interest from it is, is called capital. So the money, because it's collect interest is a capital. Um, your equipment will collect interest because of the capital or pay interest because you, you took these things. And anything that makes a profit uh, is called enterprise, like entrepreneurs, make, they make profit. Business people, they make profit. Organization, big organization itself, it, called, it makes profit. So these are called profit. So we have four resources, labor, land, capital, enterprise, and each one earns differently. So uh, a labor will earn wages, land will earn rent, capital will earn interest, and enterprise will earn profits. Now, just to test your understanding again, um, for example, if we're looking at a barcode scanner in the supermarket, what is this? Is called capital because you utilize them to do business, okay? A processing of the business. You have a fresh drink, water is called land because you are taking its resources. Then you have the copper deposit in mine is also land because resources, the work of a system analysis is a labor. The first application of e-technology to an economics textbook. This is an enterprise because it's making money and an office building is called capital because collecting rents. So the technology and the opportunity is basically, let me say one thing here. Uh, when you talk about technology, it doesn't mean here is an IT in terms of economic. It means a method of production, the technology of how to produce, is it uh, mechanics, it is uh, hand labor force focus or automation. This is the method of, so it's a method of production a way in which the resources are combined to produce goods and services. And then when you talk about the opportunity cost, now let's say I wanna, uh, um, I wanna buy a sandwich, I have $10, and I have an option of buying a sandwich or getting on the bus, go to home and eat. So, I decide to get on the bus. What's my opportunity cost is eating the sandwich. Now, if I decided to eat the sandwich, what's my opportunity cost is that I go to home. So I'm sacrificing something for something based on the choice. So the value of the next best alternative that is given up as a result of making a particular choice. So the scarcity, because you have a limited, because you have $10 and you, whether you buy a sandwich or you get on the bus, this is forced you to make a choice. And my choice was getting to the bus and the opportunity cost is involving, which is involved with cost, opportunity cost. <clears throat> now, the consumer goods and services, a product used by consumer to satisfy the wants and the and need. So if I'm hungry, I buy a sandwich. So this is a product that I bought as a consumer and satisfy my hunger. On the other hand, the capital goods is factory tools, equipment used to make the good for sale. So in the early of this class, we distinguish is the tools that you are utilizing to produce the final goods um, is the capital goods. But if you buying or getting something and you, you are using it, that becomes a consumer good. Now, let me give you a good example. You have a buy, you buy a hammer. And if this hammer is used in your home to fix things, 
becomes a consumer good. But if this hammer, you took it for your work and you worked outside, becomes what? A capital good because it's producing money for you. So making more capital good increase uh, a growth, but there is an opportunity cost uh, in terms of consumer goods. Now, decide whether each of the following is a consumer goods, capital goods, or both. As we said, the jackhammer could be capital goods because you all use the jackhammer for outside, you don't use it for your home. Carton of cigarette definitely will be a consumer good because you're buying it and uh, you smoke it. Uh, and, uh, why do we trying to differentiate between this? Because some of the decision making, where should we put our taxes? Sometimes it influence what kind of product we are talking about. So a jackhammer, a capital good. Um, so put lots of taxes on it, for example, then the people will buy less jackhammers. So the production will be less in, in that sense. But when it comes to the smoke, uh, the, usually the politician puts lots of taxes on it because it's a consumer good, first of all, and second is called inferior good. So, um, uh, and in elastic, we'll talk about it later on about that. A toothbrush is definitely a consumer good because you use it for yourself. A hammer is both, we brought that example earlier, and a farmer tractor is capital good because you're using it to, you know, to grow things in the farm. Now, <clears throat> productive efficiency. Production of a product at the lowest possible average cost. So you have a fixed cost, we cannot do anything, but how we become e efficient is when we try to minimize our uh, average cost by lowering uh, uh, variable cost, for example, as much as possible, and producing a lot, uh, so it becomes an average cost is uh, very limited. And when we talk about average cost, you know, um, number of produced unit divided by variable cost plus total variable cost plus total uh, fixed cost divided by number of value units, and that's what you get the uh, average cost. Now, allocative efficiencies, production of that combination of output that be satisfied consumer demand. We will be talking more about allocative efficiencies end of this chapter. So why we do a trade? One of the reason is we do uh, the alloc allocative efficiencies. Say I'm good in um, um, cutting the trees and my neighbor is good in um, sewing clothes. Now, if I need a clothes and my neighbor needs uh, words to keep warm, because both of us can or can be specialized in certain thing, I can cut more trees and he can sow faster. But if we decide not to do any trade, I probably need to cut trees, but I would spend more time uh, sometimes on sewing, sewing clothes. And since I'm not efficient, I'm not good in sewing clothes, it might take so much time from me, which is minimizing or lowering the number of cutting trees. On the reverse side, my neighbor might be not good, it definitely is not good in cutting trees, uh, but he needs to stay warm, so he has to go out and cut trees. And once he cuts trees, it takes him much longer than what I do. And that will affect his timing of doing a clothing, sewing clothes. So if the trade happened, both of us are good in certain things, so we can trade them because we're both of us can produce certain stuff. Um, this is applicable on a micro level and it's applicable on a macro level. A trade is a voluntary trade benefit the both parties. 
the more trade, the greater is the benefit and definitely applies to individual as well as a nation. The fundament, three fundamental questions. What should we produce? What to produce? In my case, I will cut trees and my neighbor will be sewing clothes because we're good at it. How to produce is using the technology. Uh, is how we do that with the method. Is this handy? Do we have a chainsaw? Do I have a chainsaw? It's the method that I'm going to use. And to whom? In my case, as to my neighbor, and my neighbor will sewing some clothes to me. So all economic societies um, must answer these questions. What to produce, how to produce the technology that's going to, and to whom they need to produce. Now there is four type of economics in general. There is what you call a cooperation. There's what you call a custom. Uh, I mean, uh, cooperation, command, custom, and competition. Mother countries are all usually a combination of all of them. Cooperation in the old days, um, because there is no scarce of resource, everybody goes and hunt together and everybody eats and there is a cooperation on together. They don't save food, they work together. There is also, a, you find that in small villages in, you know, uh, where everybody uh, cooks and everybody eats, everybody utilizes. And it's at some level, you would see it in some kind of Canadian societies like uh, Hero right there. They have one kitchen and everybody it goes and you know, females goes and cook there and male comes and eat. We still have this kind of societies um, around in, in, in uh, Canada. So that's what you call a cooperation. Then you have the command, which is one person is making all the orders. And the old days you had the Pharaoh style, the Roman, which is the the godfather of the, you know, the Pharaoh command everybody and he had so many slaves to work on it. And then you have the custom, which is, you know, uh, um, it's mostly you will find it in, in a religious uh, and probably in non-religious also, but it's a custom. Like, you know, it is done through the beliefs, certain beliefs, you do things in that society in a certain way. Or it could be, you know, non-religious is like, for example, we can bring a very good example we send to uh, young people to school for free kids, but we don't feed them for free. So this is kind of a custom of the worldwide or in Canada, for example. And then you have the competition is everybody competing with each other over the resources and over the productions. So these are the four kinds, but usually the mother countries are usually a combination of four above. Now, Production possibility models. Uh, production possibility models, a graphical representative of a various combination of maximum output that can be produced from the available resource and technology. There is, I will explain it more in the next slide. There is a full assumption, full employment. This is the assumption there's a full employment, best of the technology available and productivity efficiencies. We bring back the same example, cutting the trees. Now, if I can cut, if I'm focusing on only cutting the trees, I can cut 10 trees a day uh, and so, so close zero. But if I decide to sew one shirt a day, then I might be not able to cut 10 trees. I can, because my maximum is 10 trees and I'm using the chainsaw, best technologies, now, if I'm sewing one, t one shirt today, one shirt a day, so then I would probably uh, cut eight trees. When I decide to sew two shirts a day, because it takes longer time, whether I do one than two, that it doesn't take it twice a time, because I'm not that professional. It takes more time for me. Then I can only cut six or seven trees. So the numbers is reduced because there is, I'm at a full employment, I'm doing 10, but once on a nothing t-shirt, but when I do one shirt, 
there is numbers of the trees closed down and it's, it's until, you know, the product efficiencies. The way you look at it is this way, is let's say I can, or a country X can produce 195 tons of wheat, okay? And 150 uh, cars. Now, if they decide to produce only wheat, they will be producing at the point A, which is 100,000 wheat and zero cars. And if they decide to produce only car, they will be producing 150 cars and zero wheat, as you see. But let's assume they started at 100 wheat, they will be producing zero car. But if they decided to produce suddenly at 50 cars, then uh, uh, they have no choice but to reduce the number of production of wheat because they are assuming at the full employment. But if they decided to produce um, 100 wheat and 150 cars is not attainable because point of the curve represent the maximum output possible available in the resource. So in this case, they produce 100 wheat and zero car. Here they produce 95 and 50. And this is non attainable because they cannot produce that. And at this point they can produce 150, 120 cars and 65 wheat. So there is a, a maximum curve that they can utilize. Now the production possibility models is driven from the scarcities represent the point of outside curve is outside and unattainable. We'll explain later on how you can attain it. The choice represent between the point of the curves, would we said 50 cars and 60 tons of wheat. It's a choice a combination. You're 100 wheat, zero car. This is a choice. So represent by point of the curve, uh, which is efficient. And a point within the curve, if you are inside the curve, this is uh, attainable, but inefficient. Here, unattainable. You cannot reach it unless you have some kind of um, technology improvement. So we said scarcities is represented by a point outside the curve. We say the choice represents by point on the curve efficient and point within the curve inefficient. And then we can opportunity cost, we spoke about it, but represent by the downward slope of the curve. So the opportunity cost here, if I'm decided to produce 50 of cars, my opportunity cost is becomes uh, five tons of wheat because my wheat reduced from 100 to 95. Now, the law of increasing cost. The factors of production are not equally suitable. As output increase, the per unit cost additional increases, giving the production possibility curve its about uh, out the shape. So why do we have such shape? Is because, first of all, as we said in example, when I'm making ten, cutting ten trees um, at the top point, but when I decide to make one T-shirt, sewing one T-shirt, it doesn't mean I'm cutting. I'm gonna make nine trees. No, I probably need to lose the time of making cutting two trees. So this is why the shape, and then when I decided to make uh, two T-shirts, two it doesn't mean I'm losing only cutting two trees. It's not a horizontal. I'm probably losing, in this case, instead of two by two, which is four, no, two by three. So the, the cost 
is getting higher. And you, you read sometimes in, you know, there is a, a variable cost and there's a fixed cost and the variable cost might go higher after certain production, but it goes lower. But here is because of um, allocation. This is what makes the shape differently. So the factor of production are not equally suitable. And here, because I, we said that if I, I'm not good at making the t-shirts, so it's gonna take me more time to do that. The output increased, the per unit cost of additional units increases, give the production possibility curve about out shape like this. So this is what's happening here is has to be that way because I'm probably so good in producing wheat, but I'm not good in takes me longer time and more resources to produce cars. And I'm sacrificing 5% of the wheat to make it 50 cars, which is here is indicate that actually I'm good at making cars than producing wheat maybe or vice versa. Now, the law of increasing cost, the factor of, we said, uh, we spoke about it. Now, the law of increasing opportunity cost. Now, as more cars are produced, an increasing amount of wheat must be given up. So this is why you will see the curve happening here. So because when you decide to give up, um, let's say 10 million tons of wheat to produce 40 more cars. Here, you're giving up uh, 20 million tons more. See, now you're not giving up 10 more. No, because you're increasing only 10 here, but you're, you're doubling up and here is a 25. So the numbers of decreasing is depend on how efficient and effective using these resources. Now, um, these are, you can look at it as numbers where you can reduce moving from one point to another and how it's, it's done, okay? Now, I just wanted to show you how this economic growth happening. Economic growth happening is by improving the technology. And when we talk about technology, once again, we're not talking about IT. It's the way things we do. If we can do it better, more efficient, that's where the growth happens. Let's assume in the beginning, I was not able to cut 10 trees. But once I learned how to use the chainsaw, start practicing, I then, I can, I was able to do two. And with the time I was able suddenly, be, my experience gave me the opportunity to cut 10 trees. So the technology, the know-how increase, the utilizing the chainsaw much better, easier, better corner cutting it is all affecting the growth. So with a technology uh, improvement, you might have this shift that you can see here, increasing the quality of weed per period and quantity of the cars. And then you will see we can produce it instead of 100, because we prove the quality, we start producing 120. And here, we, because we moved into technology more and more, we start producing 180. But this shift does not happen in parallel always. You might have, uh, an improvement, for example, here only in car. So you will end up, and nothing in wheat, you end up with this kind of improvement. So um, improvement in the technology shift, the curve to P2 can now produce more of either good. So suddenly after a while, I became much better in sewing the t-shirt. So instead of sewing one shirt at one hour, I can sew two, for example. So I improved my technology in sewing the t-shirt, but I haven't improved my technology in cutting more trees yet. 
sometimes um, it, I can do the both. I can get better in making the trees and I cutting the trees and get better in doing the, uh, sewing the tree, uh, the t-shirts. So here where we see a shift, a total shift, but in the case of this, no, I suddenly got better in sewing, for example, but I'm having got better yet in cutting the trees. Hopefully in the future, I will learn more how to cut the trees. So the summary, the key concept to remember is economics is a relevant discipline in our society because we need to economics to understand why this happened, not what. We don't need to know what, what is easier, but why this happened, how we can do that. These two th questions, we need to answer them in uh, of the business thing in a business. So we need to understand the economic theories and utilizing the economic theory. The scientific method is use economics, which is divided into, we spoke about the micro and the macro. We talked about the scarcities, the choice and the opportunities, costs that are hurt heart of the economy. Uh, we talked about uh, selections, and we talked about between choosing a hamburger, buying a $10 hamburger or getting the bus. Uh, uh, we talked about the greater trade result in economics. So we talked about, we brought an example of cutting 10 trees or, and my neighbor is sewing five t-shirts a day. To understand what to produce, how to produce it, and who to receive is our a fundamental economics question. Uh, and we will be talking more about them in the details. Economic society may be organized through, uh, we said cooperation, command, custom, or comp and competition, or mostly now is we said mix of that. The production possibility model, we showed it. And that's it, end of the chapter. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, bye-bye.